Good? Okay. All right, so uh, thank you for the introduction, Christine. Uh, I hope that uh, the judging starts tomorrow and not now because this is a little bit of a different overview that I think that we've done in the past with these workshops. Um, but what I want to start by saying is uh, thank you guys for accepting the invitation and for coming to St. Louis. Uh, it is, uh, is a pleasure to host you guys. I'm sorry, he's just taking a video. Um, <laughs> it's a pleasure to host you guys. You can tell I'm very informal. Uh, and you're getting all of this on tape. That's wonderful. Uh, we're happy to have everybody here. The workshop is, is traditionally based out of California. Uh, we want to try to move these types of things to... Oh, I was like, what's going on? All right, we're going to start. Let me... Welcome to St. Louis, Washington University. We're, we're excited to host this foresight workshop in St. Louis in the Midwest. Uh, it's traditionally held in California. You've probably heard that before. Um, but it's nice to be able to move the location of the workshop so that we can kind of tap into the different universities and the different resources and talent pools and so forth uh, based out of the Midwest. And if anybody's from the East Coast, it's a little bit uh, shorter plane ride to get over here. So, um, and then also thank you to the Foresight Institute for agreeing to do this. Uh, this is, again, out of character for them, so this is, this is really awesome. And uh, we, we try to be as hospitable as we can at WashU. Okay, so what I'm going to attempt to do is uh, try to give you guys an overview of the field of molecular machines. And it's, it's going to be a survey of different types of molecular machines and systems, both biological and artificial. Um, and that's to give you some sort of idea of kind of the breadth of the landscape, but by no means will this be a complete survey, right? So there's, there's a lot of different systems that people work with, um, and I just wanted to paint a little bit of a picture to kind of give you some background for this. And then from there, I want to try to pose or identify uh, certain key challenges in this field, and then at the end, try to pose the question to you, how can we go about overcoming some of these challenges? So, like I said, uh, WashU is very happy to host uh, this event. Uh, WashU has a, a very long uh, history. It was established in 1853, actually by a minister. Um, and then they changed the, the, the name of the university to Washington University because it sounded very prestigious after George Washington. Um, and it, it's home to, or has been home to, 24 Nobel laureates over time, nine of which uh, actually did their pioneering work here, which is actually pretty impressive. That puts us in the top 25 in terms of Nobel laureate counts. Um, and our undergraduate uh, uh, education, our program here is actually quite strong. So according to the Wall Street Journal in 2018, we ranked uh, in 11th, um, and our med school is also a, a, a workhorse uh, for, for research and for uh, uh, patient care. Okay, so we also host presidential debates. Um, I don't know how well you can see this, but this is the standoff between Trump and Clinton. Uh, this was my first year actually here arriving on campus and they literally had Fox News set up right outside of my building so that was an interesting experience uh, to say the least but it was really interesting because they built this big wall and fence around the campus and you had to actually be carted so I was carted by several state troopers multiple times to actually get to my office and I said okay this is this is pretty serious so that was my introduction to to Wash U uh, back in uh, the fall of 2016 but our our leadership is quite strong and I like to say this because they're chemists um, but we, uh, our chancellor is actually Mark Wrighton, who was a professor at MIT uh, for a very long time, and then he ended up uh, also being the provost there. Um, he has been in charge of WashU for, I guess, over 23 years. He's a phenomenal leader, uh, phenomenal chemist. Um, and likewise, uh, Provost Holden Thorpe is also a chemist. He was the chancellor at the University of North Carolina, uh, North Carolina Chapel Hill, and he is pretty much slated to take over this chancellor position. So. We are very appreciative of this, this leadership, and, and also we want to give special thanks to the Dean of Arts and Sciences, Barbara Shaw, and also the, the Chair of uh, the Department of Chemistry, his name's Bill Burrow. And the reason for this is because uh, these two individuals were, were uh, kind enough to pony up a little bit of cash to help support this workshop uh, so that we could bring it out of California and, and, and bring all of you fine people here today. Okay. So let's get into the, 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 as Allison likes to say, the technical meat, so to speak. Thank you. Um, so you've probably seen this image before, and it's probably used too often, but it does illustrate a point, right? We have the natural systems that have evolved over a very, very long time, and they are very elegant, very complex, and have a very uh, high level of function, right? And on the other side, we have, a, I guess, a rendering of an, a robotic arm, which is this artificial system and thinking about 
whether it be artificial molecular systems or machines or artificial intelligence or, and so forth, anything could fall under this category. And one of the questions that I want to pose to you guys that is kind of the central theme of this workshop is can we design and build complex artificial molecular machines on par with nature's elegant systems? Right? So this is, we always use this terminology a lot. It's bio-inspired, it's biomimetic, and a lot of times that's just garbage, right? It's, it's not even close because nature just blows us out of the water. It's had a long time to evolve, and, and I, I, we can be inspired by it, but have we, have we reached the level of complexity that nature has attained? The answer is no, but that's the purpose of this workshop, is to try to move us in that direction, to try to get closer to that end goal. Okay, so... I'm going to start with uh, some, some examples, uh, natural examples, biological examples of molecular machinery, which I think is very important to lead off with to put this into full context, right, uh, in, in terms of, uh, of what nature can do versus what we can do. So first and foremost, nature is the polymer chemist, right? Nature can make uh, perfect, precise biopolymers. Uh, they're sequence defined, have uh, precise structure, and therefore have a uh, high level of function, very, very selective uh, uh, functionality. Um, if you look at this, it's, it's based on a, a pretty weak interaction of hydrogen bonding, right? Each one of these hydrogen bonds is on the order of 3 to 5 kcal per mole, but collectively, when you have a multivalent, uh, multiple bonding kind of approach, you actually get really strong interactions between these different DNA strands. Um, and therefore, in order to actually break up these double helices, you actually have to input energy. You have to, you have to heat the system, or you have to have some sort of chemical reagent that can break these apart, right? So this is not necessarily an easy task. However, nature has, again, developed these uh, beautiful uh, DNA polymerase systems uh, which have so many different features integrated into one system, right? If you think about it, it has the ability to, to polymerize out from the five prime to three prime direction of, a, of a, a primer strand that you add on to a single strand of DNA. And at the same time, it has the ability to recognize and read the, the template, so to speak, in the three prime to five prime direction. And also, while doing that, having the ability to correct for errors along the way. And so there's a very, very low error rate uh, with this process. And it's just, it's a beautiful process uh, that nature has, has created. And we, we capitalize it, or, or hijack it, I should say, capitalize on it or hijack it, uh, in the form of polymerase chain reaction, so PCR is probably the most widely used uh, technique in molecular biology uh, and forensics and so forth, where you can take a small segment of uh, double-stranded DNA, a small fragment, and basically amplify that over and over and over again until you have a large population of that particular fragment and you can make billions of copies in a short amount of time just through thermally cycling that, the, 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 the DNA and opening it up and adding a polymerase to this process. And so this is kind of a, a blown out view of, of that, uh, all of these things working in concert with the helicase that prevents the, or unzips the DNA and the DNA polymerase itself and recognizing the strand and doing the error correction and introducing the new uh, nucleotide and, 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 and therefore uh, generating these, this, this new, uh, uh, or copies of this sequence. So, yeah, sequence defined polymers ranging from tens of thousands to millions of base pairs long. This is a pretty incredible process. Okay, so switching over to another example, hopefully. Oop, <laughs> doesn't want to play. All right, so take my word for it. This is a motor protein, it's a kinesin protein um, that, this is a, obviously a, a rendering of it. We don't have microscopes this good quite yet. Um, but this is an example of molecular recognition and motor proteins working in concert along self-assembled polymers. So what you're looking at here are these microtubules that essentially make up the cytoskeletal uh, system inside cells. And that serves as a track on which this particular uh, molecular recognition protein system binds to that while also carrying some cargo and binding a different way. And so these can actually propagate and transport cargo in the cell. And so there are a, a wide variety, uh, this is why I like GIFs so much better than embedded videos, because I don't have to do anything. Um, but anyways, there's a wide variety of, of different types of motor proteins that exist in nature, and they all have different uh, chemical functionality, and a lot of them exist as, as dimers and, and trimers. Uh, and it, through self-assembly, molecular recognition, 
and function and, and motion, you can actually carry cargo through the cell. And again, this is based on a, uh, this microtubule. It's just a self-assembled polymer. It has positive and negative ends where it positive ends where you're adding in more of these dimers, these tubulin protein dimers, and then the negative end where it's dissolving. So it's, it's a completely flux system, right? It's not static. Everything in nature is dynamic. And a lot of systems that we make are static. We can switch and then they, they're stuck. It's permanent. But it needs to be dynamic, right? We have to have that high level of mobility and things working in concert in order to pull off some of these, these amazing uh, feats. So this process is, is essentially a, 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 an energy-driven uh, pro process through the hydrolysis of ATP to a, ADP. Um, and so that every time you do this and you cleave off a phosphate group from your energy source, you generate energy, right, that can be used, right? And this, this propagates this particular kinesin protein all the way down through this, again, self-assembled, perfect copolymer, this, uh, which, which we've referred to as microtubulin. Okay, so those are biological systems, um, a brief overview. I want to switch over now and talk about some artificial molecular machinery that's been designed, right? So there are all sorts of DNA examples and things that I did not mention and so forth. Like I said, the survey of the biological field is not complete in this little short presentation, but it does give you at least a sense of the high level of function and order uh, and, and design complexity in, these, in, the, in the natural systems. So let's talk about some unnatural ones. Well, I, I would be... Uh, uh, remiss if I didn't mention the, the Nobel laureates uh, who contributed to this field or pioneered this field, and specifically Fraser Stoddart, who will be here later this evening, uh, Jean-Pierre Sauvage, and uh, Ben Feringa, uh, who are the 2016 uh, Nobel laureates in chemistry. And so just diving right into some of their work, um, the, the core of this particular, uh, particular Nobel Prize, in my opinion, one of the things that, that really brought it to be is this concept of mechanical bonding. Right? So most of you have probably heard of ionic bonds and covalent bonds and so forth, but maybe not everybody in the room has heard about mechanical bonding before. Right? And so mechanical bonding is essentially when two rings interlock or a thread and a macrocycle interlock and they can't come apart and the only way you can actually break them apart is to break a covalent bond. So the energy required to do so is equivalent to that of a covalent bond. And so this is important uh, um, discovery because I would argue that every day, every year, there are thousands and thousands of, of new molecules that are made, and there are hundreds of maybe new reactions that are discovered every year. But it's very rare to invent a new type of bonding. And so that's what you're looking at here is mechanical bonding. And so I think this kind of set the, the stage from which the field of, of molecular machines kind of jumped off of and, and, and kick-started back in the 80s. Uh, well, prior to that, but templated syntheses were in the 80s. Okay, so just to bring it up here, the Wikipedia definitions of what a catenane and a rotaxane are, in case you're unfamiliar with this, um, is essentially two uh, macrocyclic rings interlocked. Um, and in the case of a rotaxane, it's a, a dumbbell, as it's, it's commonly referred to as, that has these stoppers on the end. And so this macrocycle cannot fall off, presumably, if you've designed the chemistry uh, correctly. And so these are referred to as mechanically interlocked molecules, and the bond is, the, is a mechanical bond. All right, so this was one of the earliest examples of being able to design a rotaxane. Uh, this is from, from Stoddart's group, where they were able to use a macrocycle that's very electron deficient and cycle it back and forth between two different stations as a function of, of uh, increasing the pH or decreasing the pH. And so you get this type of switching uh, uh, under pH control. And this, this process, again, you can, you can get a large percentage of it to favor one station over the other. Um, if the stations were identical, uh, then you would just get oscillation back and forth, and it would be that dynamic kind of nature that I talked about uh, and on the order of about 2,000 times per second. So modern advances in this um, is, is using non-natural forms of molecular recognition. So what you're looking at here is, a, uh, is another dumbbell. Uh, with a station here and a steric kind of barrier built into it because what they're uh, trying to achieve is essentially pumping these macrocycles onto this thread and getting it over that steric barrier so that, such that you can store this charge on the end of this rotaxing system. So this is essentially an artificial molecular pump, right? So you're, 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 you're going away from equilibrium, right? This is, you're trapping, kinetically trapping these different macrocycles on this portion of the thread and therefore increasing the potential energy of the system because you have so much charge buildup on one end versus the other. 
And so th by using these uh, radical recognition sites, you can actually lower the initial barrier, which would be this, you would think would be electrostatically repulsive, and, and you'd have columbic repulsion, and you would not be able to thread that on. But you can actually reduce these into radicals, and then they form a nice uh, self-assembled complex, and then it has a choice to either go left or right. If it goes right, it's kinetically trapped, right? And so this is kind of, I stole this from Fraser. I'm not this good at animations. Actually, one of you probably made it. Uh, but this is from his uh, Nobel lecture uh, in Stockholm. And this would be an idealized system where if your core, the middle of your, 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 your rotaxane was a polymer, a really, really long polymer, and you could continuously feed on these different uh, uh, macrocycles and store and build up this charge in the middle. Um, you could even uh, envision potentially making these systems transmembrane type systems where you can then introduce things into cells through these guided channels. Again, very much like the, you think about the cytoskeletal tract inside cells, how they move cargo back and forth, right? So this is obviously conceptual. I don't know if anyone's done this yet. Maybe you guys can tell me. <laughs> All right. So I want to give, a, so I've talked about mechanical bonding and I talked about catenanes and rotaxanes. I want to give, pay tribute to, to Ben Feringa's work because it really also is revolutionary in the sense that you can design a molecule that can give you rotation about a center, in this case a, a, a sterically crowded double bond, and you can actually rotate this around. So what that looks like, if I bring up the cartoon from CNE News uh, article on this, um, you can see how you can uh, cycle this unidirectionally where this component here will circle around this, this central double bond. Right? So I'm, I'm going to use very general terms because we have a general audience, but in uh, GIF form or video form here, you can kind of see this in motion, uh, which was on the cover slide, of where you can irradiate with light and then use heat above certain thermal uh, thresholds to continuously rotate this in the same direction. And so I would argue that if you have rotaxanes and catenanes that have translational motion where rings move relative to one another or a ring slides down a thread, um, this would be kind of like the, the gear or the, the axle on a, on a bike or something where you have this, this rotor um, or even a, a car, which I'll show in a second. Which, this is the design here. So this is a, a, a synthetic endeavor that is, is uh, quite ambitious or was quite ambitious, especially with all of the different stereo centers that are present. Um, but nonetheless, they were able to synthesize this molecule. So what you're looking at is essentially a nano car. This is the chassis and you have the, the rotors uh, on the sides here. Uh, and when you actually activate this with a, an STM tip, so you actually run a current through it at about 500 millivolts, um, it'll, you can get these to absorb that energy and you get these to rotate. And so this is a, a pictorial representation uh, provided by the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, um, which shows these rotations of these particular rotors, these paddles essentially, that are sticking out. And so this was actually on the featured on the cover of Nature uh, called Nano Motoring. And so this was uh, pretty revolutionary, uh, even, and it's not, it's not that old, but people got really excited about it. And in 2017, they actually hosted the world's first nano car race. Um, so you had all of these different people make different designs of their favorite nano car. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain why I'm doing quotations here in a second. Um, all these different designs of nano cars that they then put down on surfaces, whether it's gold or or, or, or silver or, or mica or some surface and then electrochemically try to activate these and then time them as they go across some distance. Um, the winner was actually uh, Jim Tours' uh, adamantane functionalized nano car. It doesn't quite look like a car, but there you go. Um, and it was actually the fastest one. And so this is what it actually looks like when you have, you drop these down on a surface and then you, you put the uh, STM tip over the, uh, over the top of it and you activate these electrochemically, you can get them to travel distances. And so um, the actual time of this was the average speed was about uh, 95 nanometers per hour, so super fast. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'd rather take my, my POS uh, against that, but pretty good for a nanometer sized uh, uh, vehicle. And uh, they actually had to take a break because they were just blowing the competition away. Um, it's interesting, let me see what's on the next slide, okay. It's interesting though because Faringa did not enter his nano car into this race, so I was wondering why. I was like, well, that's the most logical thing, right? You're the first person to make a nano car. Why wouldn't you want to pimp out your Ferrari? And, and sure enough, he didn't. Um, and so at the end of the CNA News article, there's actually a little quote that says, Ben Faringa kindly uh, declined to comment on this story, as did the other Nobel laureates. And so um, I think in their view, maybe these aren't nano cars because 
the only one that actually shows any real uh, rotation and, and similar to the Feringa system is the, the Ohio Bobcat where you have these ro rotating units on the sides. The rest of them are kind of like dragged along like a wagon from the STM tip. But nonetheless, it's, it's interesting to see where people are taking this, right? This is, this is getting to a, a higher level of complexity in terms of design of, of molecules uh, and, 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 and hopefully molecular machines. Yes, that's right. Yeah, it looks. That's part. I was trying to think what I would call it, and it's a nano segue. That's great. Yeah. So that's cheating because he doesn't have a, cha a full chassis. He's only got two wheels, like a motorcycle, a lot faster than a car. Thank you for that. Okay. So what are other applications potentially? Right. So Faringa's uh, motor has has been explored, and a, a lot of derivatives of his motor have been explored in a lot of different ways. So again, this is work from Jim Tours Lab at, at Rice, where they actually uh, synthesized a, a, a known uh, Faringa-based motor. And then these R groups here are either fluorophores or some sort of peptide sequence so that they could bind proteins on the surface of cell membranes, in particular cancer cells. And so the, the thought is, or the, 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 the thought experiment was, can we lay these down on the surface of a cell membrane and use UV light to activate it and get that, that motor spinning and then try to bore a hole, hole into the cell membrane and therefore kill the, the particular cancer cell. And so these are images, I guess you can't see them very well, but the, the little red dots that have the, their fluorophores attached to the motor actually make its way into the cell and you can see them entering the cell and then you can actually see cell death and they obviously did a lot of controls for this, uh, but I'm not going to cover that in this particular, uh, this particular presentation. But nonetheless, this is an interesting application, right? It's, a, it's actually going after a biomedical application. Um, obviously, it's a little bit difficult if you wanted to apply this, let's say, to a solid tumor mass um, in the body because then you can't use UV light, you can't really even use visible light, you need near IR light. But this is a step again in the right direction, looking for potential biomedical applications of these complex molecular machines. And then I want to finish with a couple of examples from David Lee's group. I think David Lee, uh, for those that you don't know, if you don't know David Lee, he's at the University of Manchester. He's a former PhD student of Fraser's. Um, he's phenomenal. This guy is, is at the forefront of, of making uh, really trying to make molecular machines do work and have precise function. And in this particular case, um, what, he's, what they've done is, is synthesized a track that has these different amino acid residues built into the track and a macrocycle that sits on top that has a nucleophile dangling, dangling off the end. And it, the, the goal is to, as is, is represented here in this picture, is to have that macrocycle just kind of, again, dynamically just moving back and forth it encounters a, a bump or a barrier that has a functional group and tries to scoop that particular amino acid up and then just continues down the line such that you have a little peptide synthesizer. So if you guys are familiar with solid phase peptide synthesis, it's an iterative process, right, where you add one amino acid at a time and you try to make larger systems. Um, and this is kind of similar to that, except you're using an oligomer or a polymer scaffold in which you to, to, to do so. So this is another, and David Lee's an excellent salesman too. He's got a lot of great videos on his website, so it saves me the time and trouble. Um, this is the process in, in GIF form. So you can actually watch in cartoon form this, this picking up these individual units and sequentially putting these different things together. So you can envision a, a track that had X number of subunits that had whatever amino acid sequence that you would want in your particular peptide. Um, and then it would be an interesting question, which they did not demonstrate in this work, but it would be fascinating if you could actually do this type of synthesis in vivo, right? If you could deliver the track in a dormant state and somehow activate the dormant state and get it to go through and synthesize these things in vivo for therapeutic applications. Um, I guess it didn't go past that. All right. So this is a, yeah, a final example of something from David Lee's group as well, where it is synthesizing, this is more in the, in the, in the scope and theme of, of Eric Drexel's uh, uh, mind of, uh, and, and theme of atomically precise manufacturing. And so looking at this, this is another chemical system uh, developed by David Lee's group, which has this switching mechanism in the middle that allows this to kind of go back and forth to either side and, and chemically convert these end groups such that you can then do chemistry on them and get uh, certain diastereoselectivities selectivities uh, associated with making these small molecules and having complex stereocenters adjacent to one another. And so again, trying to use molecular scaffolding with pre-programmed function and switching 
to control or do something useful, which is to establish stereo centers in a small molecule, which you could envision if you could expand upon this would be very useful for pharmaceutical applications. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up in these last two slides with basically, so this is just a generic plot that I made that actually is not to scale at all. Uh, but what I'm trying to emphasize here is enhanced function and robustness versus material design and the level of integration uh, that, that, is, that is therein. And at, at the top, we have DNA polymerase, which is just amazing, uh, a set of, uh, of proteins and enzymes that come together to, to replicate DNA. Um, at the bottom, we have basic molecular switches, right, where we can program, we can change the pH, or we can do something, we can get the macrocycle to move. In between, we have these motors from Faringa, which I, chemically, they're, they're, the, the base motor is not too intensive, synthetically speaking. Um, and then this kind of hybrid thing, which I haven't really talked about until just now, which is basically connecting the switches or the rotaxanes with the proteins and enzymes. So this is some, some relatively new work out of Matt Francis's group, but it was mainly the, the brainchild of Carson Bruns, who was a former PhD in, uh, of Sam Stoop and Fraser Stoddart at Northwestern, and they actually made this conjugated system with a, with a protein and a rotaxane hanging off of this in a very precise manner and, and, and unimolecularly. Um, if we, if again, looking back at some more complex chemical systems, you can see again the David Lee example, so this molecular assembler, and then the nanocars I would put on the same scale, but there is, if I, if I had more screen, this would be way up there, and there would be a big gap between what we've been able to demonstrate and what nature can do, and so that's kind of one of the points of, of this particular workshop. Um, so, future directions. One of the things that I've always wondered is, okay, you look at, you look at all these systems, a lot of times it's, it's proteins or enzymes that are multiple subunits that come together that self-assemble beautifully into a perfect discrete molecule and then have great selectivity in terms of chemical transformations that it's able to do. Um, can we take some of these artificial molecular machines that we have created over the last, let's say, 30, 40 years and obviously not build a bike, but showing the point of integration, right? Bringing all of these together into a collective system where we can then have a higher level of function other than just molecular switches or molecular rotors. And then one of the things that that's obviously has to happen is that this has to be scalable, it has to be robust, you have to be able to cycle it several thousands of times. A lot of times these switches and, and, and rotors and so forth, they can only go a, a certain number of cycles before they, before they fail. And then, again, the combination of natural proteins and enzymes and artificial molecular machines. Is this possible? What say you? Right? And so that's, that's the question that, uh, that I'm posing to you guys, is this is the lay of the land. Um, we're really far away from where nature is, uh, but how could, we, how could we advance towards that end goal? And so thank you guys for being here, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them now. Right. I don't know how long that was. stuck up on that and we're gonna have five minutes now for q a if anyone would like to start this is the time you know really when that's the goal that we're working towards today so anything that isn't clear now's the time to ask um I, i'm always a little bit curious about when people you know attempt to you know, say your nature evolution has produced these magnificently well worked out uh, details but you know I, I think if you say that we're way behind what nature can do by some measures yes mm. but uh, by other measures we're far I mean birds fly and they're amazing uh, but uh, I got here on an airplane that carried a bunch of people that, that outperforms any any bird and it, let, let me let me suggest that that you know ev we're actually working and will have in uh, July of this year an artificial retina in human clinical trials. Okay, and the retina is a great example of why evolution takes some bad, makes some bad choices. Uh, your, your retina is built back backwards with the rods and cones on the back side and all the nerves on the front. And, and that leads to your, the blind spot in your eye, eye and, and a variety of other things that the human uh, well, brains have learned how to deal with all that. But so I, I think there's some great opportunity to, to say, well, let's look to uh, nature for inspiration. And by the way, a great quote uh, from Ned Siemens. I, I'm going to give you here if you, if you don't yeah, know yeah. it. Probably do, but go ahead. Okay, so, so somebody 
told him, oh, you're doing this wonderful biomimetic work, and, and they'd go, oh, hell, I wish I was anywhere near good enough to be a biomimetic. I think of myself as a bioclectic. Okay. Uh, just, you know, stealing what he could from here sure. or there. Sure, sure. Uh, but, you know, so I, I think there's some, one thing I'll try to get into later where I think there may be an opportunity for us at Zyvex Labs to maybe play into what uh, some chemists are trying to do is uh, to go back to Eric's uh, original thought of mechanochemistry, uh, we've developed mainly uh, taking the, the invention of Joe Lighting, hydrogen depassivation lithography, we work really hard to make SDMs better at positioning. Mm -hmm. And for instance, we've recently uh, have a great treatment hysteresis correction tool. So we've gotten really a lot better at, at nano positioning. And so maybe there's an opportunity for us to help take a low yield uh, approach, a, a low yield reaction, uh, and make it a lot higher yield by moving a couple of molecular parts close together and getting to react in a way that would be really hard to come up with a synthesis approach to getting to happen. Maybe we can help out with that. Now, I'm not a chemist for sure, uh, and so I have very little appreciation of that, but I do know that we can do nano positioning in a way that is, uh, I think, superior to what we've moved the, that technology forward. So we'd be looking for opportunities that people would be interested in saying, how can we use some version of mechanochemistry to put a couple of reactants close together and get them getting to uh, where you don't have to work up a really clever protection deprotection group, but just bring the two groups that you want to react in the orientation that you want them close together and get them to react. So I'd be looking for opportunities where we can maybe help out with that. Yeah, I, I think everything you said is is excellent points. I agree with you. So my my analogies or my comparisons to nature are not to say that we will never come up with non-natural systems or artificial materials um, that can serve great function. In some cases, maybe even outperform nature because the, the material stability is a lot better. A lot of biological systems are meant to die, right, and degrade over time. And some certain functions, you don't want that, right? And so I completely agree with you, but my comparison here, my analogy here, is more from the design complexity, not trying to say how can we do exactly what nature does or be a uh, biocleptic, as, as you said that Ned Seaman had said. And, and so the hybrid example I showed here at the end, um, am I not mic'd or something? No, it's, okay, is it going? Oh, I see. Um, let me see if I can go back. Uh, yeah, so this hybrid system, right, with the, the protein and the rotaxane, um, you know, that's one of those situations where we're, we're doing the biocleptic kind of biohybrid approach. But I mean, I'm a polymer chemist, right? This is, that's, I, I make a lot of artificial synthetic materials all the time. And we're trying to introduce non-natural forms of molecular recognition into those polymers so that they have pre-programmed function that you can't find in nature. So I'm right there with you. But when it comes to integration, and when it comes to molecular recognition, like so many processes that, are con that work in a concerted fashion and, and do so seamlessly without stepping on each other's toes, Nature's got us whipped every time, right? But of course, I can make you a higher cross-link thermoset and give you substantially improved properties in doing so that you will never find in nature. So there are certain properties that we can obtain. It just depends on the function, the application, right? What you want to build. So I agree with you 110%. So I think, Sergey, you got a question? Actually, uh, to follow your logic, uh, so for any field, the important transition is from the basically a very long-range vision research when you just want to make sure that things are possible to the point when something you can actually practically make something useful. So a simple example, the donator manipulation started in nanoscience, at least from a certain perspective, and it was fantastic physics. But that field remained narrow for a very long time because the entry barrier was increasing with each nature paper, so you need to do better than people before you. And by the same token, there was no end application, so you can only do fundamental science. When quantum computers came online, the situation is totally different. All of a sudden, capability to put that and you want makes a device, and correspondingly, the field now develops much faster than in any time in the previous 20 years. 
So with respect to the molecular measurements, it may be too early, but can you speculate what can be the first practically useful application? Well, I mean, that, that's a great question. I mean, I, I gave or tried to give a couple of examples in this presentation, but obviously I could have spent, you know, an entire couple of lectures just talking about potential applications. But on the flip side of that, um, I could also argue that the field is still relatively young, right? I mean, we're, it was, it was just, it was such a, uh, a battle, as, as my PhD advisor, Fraser Stoddart, likes to say, just to convince people that, that you actually had threaded a macrocycle on, or, or a macrocycle onto a thread, and then it wasn't some side-on interaction. And as early on in his career, first five to 10 years, people just didn't believe it. They just didn't believe it. And then eventually you just had to keep doing, making more systems, publishing more papers, and then more people entered into the field, and then it kind of just, it just blew up. But I mean, I, I can quote the, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, right, that awarded the Nobel Prize, that there may not be an application right now, but these are components just like you would think about with the bicycle that I showed, right? There's a gear, there's a chain, there's a pedal, there's, there's a steer bar, steering, or a, a steering handle and, and a seat, right? All of these things, wheels and so forth. They, it doesn't work if any of those are missing unless you're like work at the circus and you can ride a unicycle or something, you don't need the handlebars. But, but anyways, no, the point is, is that I think it's a really young field and I think that's kind of what, what you just asked is almost precisely the point of this workshop, right? Is to, everybody collectively say, what are the challenges and problems in my field? And how is it that maybe perhaps we collaborate with people that have completely different skill set and background and, and integrate these materials potentially? Um, or don't need mechanical bonding or you don't need a motor, but whatever, again, you can design it through chemistry, right? Whether it be inter inorganic, organic, material science, physics, computation, all of that is relevant. Uh, in order to, to coming up with these different types of high-level systems and, and, and functional systems. So there's a couple, but it's not, it's not an expansive uh, uh, application view right now. That's, that's a very uh, small part of the story. And I think that, I think things, especially with the awarding of the Nobel Prize, I think more people will enter into the field, and I think it will motivate, and you'll get people with fresh ideas and fresh perspectives, and hopefully, um, use this to go after certain applications. I know that Ben Faringa uses a lot of his motors. They've actually figured out a way to use it uh, for uh, actually doing in vivo therapy. Um, they, 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 he works with a lot of uh, doctors in the Netherlands uh, where they actually do, they will open up a patient and they will use light activated uh, lines to, to actually perform certain uh, uh, things, certain operations. So there are people moving in that area, but I think there was a long period of time where we had to establish the base the, the foundation of this, this fundamental chemistry. Um, and, then, and then now people are, now that we understand them better, we can design better components and then also seek to maybe potentially integrate these components and hopefully find applications for them. Uh, I'm right there with you. I think hopefully most people in this room are. And last Steve? Question, Steve. Um, I can see situations where a single motor might be useful. For example, digging a hole into a cancer cell. And triggering apoptosis or necrosis. But I think that for a lot of us, including me, I'm interested in examining the ability to gang these systems together or to stack them in such a way like, you know, putting batteries in series to get a higher voltage or amperage, mm -hmm. that that's really something that I'd like us to consider. Can we think of ways that these motors could be, you know, teamed up mm -hmm. to get the force that's delivered from something that's nanoscale to Correct. something that's macroscale. Yeah, so that's a great point, and I didn't actually show this example, but their, uh, Nicholas Gias Giasaponi's group um, uh, has taken these motors and they have actually functionalized the, the end groups with, uh, the. you can functionalize the periphery of this molecule quite easily, and they've actually put polymer chains off of the edges of this motor. And so then they took that as their building block and then polymerized it out into three dimensions to make a gel. And so now you have a bunch of these different motors in the gel and when you shine light on it, you can actually get a macroscopic object to contract. And then they put in a modulator as well to get it to expand and do so reversibly. So again, that single motor, if you could envision the, the thought experiment of putting a single motor into that large polymer network, that gel, and trying to get it to contract, it would not work. But if you couple the, the effect right, of, of several of these different motors embedded into the material, then you can actually achieve macroscopic actuation and therefore apply an appreciable force to do work.
which is to reorganize a, a network. So that's, that's again, that's, that's a pretty, uh, there's not, there aren't too many examples of that, right? And that's kind of my point here was integration uh, of these types of molecular machines together, working together, you can achieve far greater things. Jonathan, that's exactly what we wanted. So if you can see we're trying to solve this problem from two ways. One is there's a push-pull. There's, there's science pushing forward and uh, saying, all right, here's what we can do today. Where are the applications? What's the first application? And that is the prize-winning question, uh, if whoever can answer that. And then there's the other side, which is the pull, which is the pull of real-world problems and the pull of real-world funding for those problems. So that's the connection we're trying to make. So Jonathan gave us the science pushing side, and we have David Forrest from the Department of Energy, who's going to be talking about the pull of real world <coughs> problems, the pull of real world money, uh, and uh, David, if you could come up and give us that orientation.